Hello, and welcome to Discovering True Health, your weekly deep dive into health and wellness. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the little bell to stay up to date on all our upcoming shows. You can also check out additional information on our website, Instagram, and Facebook. All those links are below. So did you know that new research has branded sitting as the new smoking because of its health risks? On today's show, we'll be learning why that is and some easy, simple lifestyle hacks to lose weight, stay fit, and improve the quality of our lives through making movement part of our lifestyle. Now, sitting for extended hours may seem like a small thing, but in fact does have a profound impact on our health and quality of life. A recent study done of sitting time versus activity levels found that those who sat more than eight hours a day with no physical activity had a risk of dying similar to the risk of dying from obesity and smoking. And research has linked sitting for long periods of time to a number of health concerns, including obesity, cancer, heart disease, depression, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, excess body fat in that midsection and abnormal cholesterol levels. So with all our new technology, many of us have desk jobs working at a computer. We're not out plowing the fields anymore, growing our own food, doing physical labor. So while technology is great and it's improved our lives in so many ways, we also need to be aware of and find ways to offset the detrimental health effects technology can cause both physiologically and psychologically. So here to help us figure this out is Ben Ruder. He's an exercise physiologist and university faculty member. He holds numerous professional certifications in major strength and conditioning associations. And his philosophy is that movement is not just an activity, but a lifestyle that enhances, enhances our quality of life. So thank you so much for joining me today, Ben. Christy, thanks for having me. Always happy and enjoy talking about movement. Yes, such an important topic. Now, you're a big advocate of the mindset that movement should be treated as a lifestyle, not just an activity or a workout to be completed. Can you share with us a bit of your journey in the fitness world? And what was the catalyst that inspired your passion behind this mindset? Why is it so important? And how has this mindset made an impact on your life? Sure. I think probably the first time that it even occurred to me that movement was important. I mean, I was a physical education major in college. I always was a mover, but I always took it for granted. And I remember when I went to get my doctoral degree, a, a good friend of mine, who's also my mentor, told my major professor, he said, hey, if Ben's ever a jerk to be around, tell him to go out for a bike or ride or run because he's going to be much easier to deal with afterwards. And at the time, this was probably 20 years ago, I kind of chuckled when I found out about it. It's like, yeah, well, yeah, that's kind of true. If I don't get my daily workout in, I'm probably a little bit of a bear to be around. And then fast forward, probably about eight or nine years ago to about four years ago, two things happened at about the same time. You know, throughout this time, I'd earned a doctorate. I was teaching at a university, teaching all the recommendations of the World Health Organization, you know aerobic exercise, strength exercise, uh, flexibility training, all of which I think are very important and I want everybody to do them, but we also have to meet people where they are. And many people, when they read those requirements are like, wow, that's way beyond where I am. Or maybe I can't do that because you have various physical limitations. So that's kind of, as I taught, I realized, you know, this is great, but we're missing so many people. And then in about 2013 to 2017, I had the, and I'm saying this semi-sarcastically, semi-jokingly, the good fortune to have numerous eye surgeries due to an ongoing uh, detaching retina. Yeah. And along about the same time, I had one of my Labradors developed idiopathic epilepsy. So kind of the two of them at the same time, there were periods of time when I was having surgeries for any of your li listeners who have had retinal surgery, one of the things they often do when they repair the retina is they put an air bubble or they put a uh, silicon inside your eye and you have to hold the position so that the retina can essentially stick to the back of the eyeball. So cool. there were periods of time where maybe I was allowed to move for 12, excuse me, maybe I was allowed to move for two hours out of 24, the rest I had to hold the position. And suddenly what I took for granted 
maybe I couldn't do. And I, I would schedule, okay, I could, if I could just hold this position for this much longer. And I realized that what I took for granted and what I took uh, as enjoyment was something that really was an important part of my life. By the same token, in about 2015, one of my Labradors that I spend a lot of time running and hiking with developed idiopathic epilepsy. And I asked my lab's neurologist, a shout out for pet insurance. So yes, my dog had a neurologist, you know, what can she do? And the neurologist said, she can do whatever she wants to do. And through the course of the next four years, we're coming up on the three-year anniversary of when I had to put her down because the epilepsy was not controlled. But over the next four years, I uh, she ended up being on eight or nine different medications and the epilepsy was not well controlled. But I still remember the neurologist saying, I don't know what you're doing with this dog, but keep doing it because given how many medications she's on, her heart should not sound this good and she should not be this calm. And what I was doing is I was taking her to the park and we were walking, we were running. For any of your listeners who are familiar with the phrase fartlek or speed play, which is a, a Scandinavian term. It basically means you do whatever you want or you have the pace of whatever you want or whatever the activity. So we'd go, we'd go out for a walk and maybe she'd like to walk one day because she wasn't feeling well, or maybe she'd want to run one day, or maybe it was a mixture and we were just moving. And I realized as I was recovering from these surgeries on my half and also seeing her with these medications having the effect of her, one of the things that both of us really enjoyed doing was moving. And if we think about it, if we do all of the recommendations, so we go to the gym five days a week or six days a week, and we do our three to five cardiovascular sessions, and we do our two to three strength training sessions, and maybe we take two or three yoga classes, or we do something to work on our flexibility or range of motion, what do we do the rest of the time? You were alluding to this in your introduction. We, we as a society in general, and we're overgeneralizing here, but we have a tendency to spend most of our time sitting. Hmm. So I started to make a conscious choice. What can I do to move? And you and I were chatting before recording for your listeners. If you see me moving around, I'm not getting any money for this, but I'm on a Pona Ola board, which is actually like a wobble board, but in each corner, there's an air filled ball. So I'm standing on a wooden board that's floating on air. I used to use a wobble board, but this Labrador that I mentioned liked to lie underneath the desk. And I was afraid that she would pinch her nose on the wobble board so I got the Pono Ona board so I couldn't pinch her nose. And one of my favorite memories and favorite pictures that my girlfriend got of me and her while I was doing a podcast is me standing on the Pono Ola board with uh, Emma and her chin resting on my feet on the Pono Ola board. Mm -hmm. So throughout this, as I was doing this and came up with the idea of starting doing podcasts and promoting it, I realized movement is a lifestyle. It's not just an activity. So if I even reach one person who starts to take this to heart and change their life even slightly, then it's successful because at the end of the day, we're kind of obligated if we're in this profession, in this field to promote the importance of movement, to promote the importance of activity for everybody. Not everybody has to be an athlete, but most people, if not everybody can benefit from movement. Absolutely. And I love how you mentioned, you know, how we're missing so many people by not you know, by, you know, the, the, these standard guidelines, some people don't have that time to incorporate their lives or they have a physical limitation and, you know, or they may not, they may not be able to afford it if it involves going to a health club or, or a fitness club. Right. Exactly. And it's, yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, I can relate when you said, you know, we kind of take our health for granted until we lose it and movement for granted until we're not able to. And then it's kind of hits us like, Oh, we kind of start really seeing the value and really striving for, you know, the op optimizing it. Can I ask you, did, did you get a detached retina from bungee jumping? <laughs> Cause I've heard that's how people get. It's, I have a, an eye that's extremely nearsighted. So uh, my normal eye was 25 millimeters front to back. My bad eye was 30 plus millimeters. So it basically turned into a physics problem. And this was something I was born with. But it. interestingly, you said bungee jumping, my retinal surgeon who I've developed a very good relationship with. I remember when he repaired it the first time I said, well, what can I do? He said, well, you can do anything you want except initial mixed martial arts and bungee jumping. And as a joke to him, I said, well, suddenly I have this urge to bungee jump, which I don't. 
<laughs> yes, I've never, I'm, I have an, 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 an aunt who is a nurse and she would always tell me bungee jumping will detach your retinas. Don't do it. <laughs> I always remember that. Um, now, I briefly mentioned at the top of the show that limited or lack of movement or sitting for long periods um, has such a profound negative impact on our health. So let's kind of get into the details and first get a good understanding of why it's important for people to move regularly. So how does sitting for long periods impact us negatively, both physiologically and psychologically? I think before we talk about that, two things to mention for your listeners to consider is first of all, and I know this was in one of the questions you asked me prior to the interview. First of all, many people may say, well, I don't have time to move. One of the things we need to consider is when we're moving around, and I'm using that kind of as a pun, but when we're active and we don't have an illness or a disability or a problem, it's easy to say, I don't have time to do this. Suddenly, if you develop a health problem, it's not a matter of not having time to take care of it. You have to take care of it. So that brings me to the second point, and I have to give a shout out to a good friend of mine, and I've had him on my podcast a couple of times, Don Moxley, who talks about lifespan versus health span. Hmm. So you can read you know, statistics, the average lifespan of a, of a woman is a little bit longer than a male, and the United States has a lifespan of about this many years, and other countries have this many years. Nobody really talks about health span, and health span refers to living in the absence of illness. Hmm. So you probably, if you go out in the sun and you're relatively fair skinned like me, you make sure that you wear some sort of sun protection. You know, you, you try to eat your fruits and vegetables. And one of the most important things that we can do is we can move more. So as you noted, we have a tendency to be in a sedentary society. We don't look at it as sedentary. It's not meaning we're not moving our, our, uh, our brains. But if we're at a desk all day, it takes a conscious effort to add work in. It's an interesting thing that you asked about or you were mentioning that we have a tendency not to move because we are growing to be more and more inactive. My contractor, who I have a very good relationship, who's done extensive work on my house and my property over the past 11 or 12 years, goes to the gym two or three days a week before he goes out on the job. Wow. He said, I have to do this now. And he's in his early 40s. He said, I have to do this now. Otherwise I pull muscles, I ache at the end of the day and I don't wanna do that. So even if you're in an active lifestyle, you may have to do a little bit more. So when, we, so when we get to what you said, what happens when we're sedentary? At the base level, or if you think long-term, our muscles atrophy or get weaker. If we don't move our joints through a full range of motion, we lose range of motion. So we get stiffer or we feel stiffer. And we just feel lethargic. If you've ever had the misfortune or good fortune to be on a 24 hour flight or an 18 hour flight or something like that, think about how you feel when you get off that plane, even if you got up every hour or so and walked up and down the cabin, you don't feel very good. That comes through movement. If you think about if you've ever gone to a conference and you've sat all day and you've listened to speakers, and this is one of the interesting things when I go to my professional conferences, I try to stand in the back because I can shift around and I can move because I know that if I sit in a chair, you could say, okay, I need to maintain good posture. If I'm really into it and I'm interested, eventually I'm gonna be down like this. So there are so many things that can happen. Long-term, it, it can have an effect on the calories you burn each day. It can have an effect on your mental outlook. I am not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a mental health professional, but it really sticks in my mind what one of my professors on my dissertation committee said when I was getting my doctorate. He said, you know, I wish more physicians and more mental health professionals, and this was 20 years ago, would recommend exercise to their patients before they started prescribing antidepressant drugs immediately. And I'm not saying that these drugs don't have a good purpose. I'm not being a mental health professional, but I'm saying one of the things we have to assess is what is your outlook on life and how active are you? There are people with, with chemical imbalances. There's no question about that. I know for me, some of the things as I've adapted through my life, one of the non-negotiables is I need most days of the week, at least 40 minutes of conscious movement. And I'm fortunate enough is I have two accountability partners in my Labrador retrievers 
where anybody who has dogs, if I don't bring them to the park, run with them, walk with them, do fartlek training, they're going to be pains in the butts. And I know if I go more than a day or so with some sort, without some sort of formal 40 minutes of movement, notice I'm calling it movement, not a workout, that I'm not as productive in work. I don't feel as good. My aches and pains are more aches and pains. And probably for me, the most important thing, all of my good ideas have come when I'm outside moving. All of the best friends that I've made in my life, I've made through moving. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, all my, I've recently moved to a new state and all my new friends here now are all dog owners, <laughs> the dog community. <laughs> Because that's, you know, it's a good way to meet people. Um, and I love that concept that you're talking about, about lifespan versus health span. That's so brilliant. I mean, and it's so true because we could live till we're 90, but are we thriving till we're 90? You know, I, I just did a show on self-care and she was talking about the blue zones in the world where these people are living till they're in their, you know, hundreds, but they're not, you know, decrepit in their hundreds, they're thriving in their hundreds and really looking at, okay, what are these people doing differently? And, and they're in all different parts of the world. So that's such a amazing point to bring up. Yeah, I know, again, the same person who made me aware of uh, Healthspan, Don Moxley, we've talked a little bit about the blue zones. And one of the things they all have in common is they all do a lot of movement, not exercise, but they do movement. They all eat fresh fruits and vegetables. They all have some sort of a purpose in life. And I mean, you were mentioning people want to live to the 90s. I've actually said, not really jokingly to my girlfriend, and I've said to other people, I want to live to be 104. Hmm. And the first time she heard that, she said, well, why do you want to be 104? It's like, and it was a number I just pulled out of my head because I'm 54 right now. And I'm what would be categorized as middle-aged. Right. But there's so many things that I still get excited about. You know, my dad is 86 or 87. He went to law school when he was in his early 70s. Wow. You know, my, grand, my grandfather practiced law until he was in his uh, late 80s. Right. And just to give, uh, give you an idea, because I know so many people say, oh, I'm too old to do that. Or I'm, you know, I can't do that anymore. You know, one of the things we want people to be able to do is you want to be able to do what you want to do literally until the day you die. I mean, ideally, if you enjoy going out and walking with your wife, your husband, your spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, your dog, the best way for you to go would be when you're at a ripe old age and you drop dead on that walk of a massive stroke. <laughs> Horrible awesome. thing to say on the one hand for your family members, because all of a sudden you're there once, not right. there at the end. And the story that I've told when I used to teach at a school in Florida, when my parents were first married, there was a lady in their church who was in her late 80s. She fell and she broke her hip. And at that point in time, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, what they did when somebody broke their hip is they just put them in bed. They're like, well, you know, life's over. She lived another 20 years with no dementia. Wow. So I'd tell this to this health class. And then I'd contrast this. This was in Florida. And in Florida on the West Coast, there's the Pinellas Trail, which is a rails to trails for walking, running, biking. About a gentleman in his early 80s who had done triathlons and running races. One Labor Day or Memorial Day, he went out for a bike ride and dropped dead off the bike of a massive stroke. Wow. I'm, talking, I'm talking to these 18 and 19 year old students. and I'm saying, isn't that great? And they're looking at me like I'm the most evil person in the world. <laughs> but if you contrast, I didn't realize the terminology, you know, the, the health span. If you contrast this, got up that morning, oh, I think I'm going to go for a bike ride before I go see the fireworks or whatever. That's it. You were able to do what you wanted to do versus yes. sitting in a bed with your mind, mind sharp as a tack. Yes. So we can't control, well, we can to some extent, but some of us are going to develop cancer. Yep. Some of us are going to develop, you know, debilitating kidney disease. You can't choose or you can't determine whether or not you're going to get hit by a car walking across the road. I mean, you can look both ways and take the proper preparations. But one of the things that we can do to stave off losing our mobility, losing our activity, and what can help maintain our mental acuity is regular movement. And I'm not saying exercise, I'm saying movement. You know, We'd like people to do all those recommendations from the World Health Organization. Do those yeah. things. And then if you're doing those things, do more. Right. If you're, and, not, if you're not doing those things and you're saying that's too much, then start doing something. And I always tell the clients that I work with with personal training. And when I worked as an athletic trainer in rehab setting, when people would get depressed, you know, you've got somebody coming in who's going through an anterior cruciate uh, 
knee ligament repair. And I'm like, there are t- periods of time where mentally you're down because you're looking at a year, two years recovery. Look at what you were doing three months ago. <laughs> are you doing better than what you were doing three months ago? And if you are, you're headed in the right direction. I always tell people, if you have a goal and you schedule movement and you look at it three months later and you've achieved 75 to 80% of what you've scheduled, that's a success. You're not going to achieve 100%. And social media is horrible that way because if you want to look good in a bikini, if you want to look good with your shirt off, if you want to look good doing stupid pet tricks or running, (laughs) that's what they're posting. They're not posting the picture when they went out for a walk and they forgot their water on a hot day and they ended up literally curled up in a ball. So they're posting the best. And rather than judging yourself off other people and, oh, well, look what Christy's doing. I can't do that. Look at what you're doing now and say, what can I do better? And have accountability partners or people who can look at you non-emotionally. Great example of this is I mentioned all of my eye injuries and the fact that my activity from 2013 to 2017 was significantly curtailed from what I enjoyed doing. And as I started to come back and was feeling really good, I had the good fortune, again, I'm being sarcastic, of herniating a disc in my low back. I went through the rehab of that and I kept getting hurt, little niggling things, ankle injuries, knee injuries, et cetera. And a good friend of mine who's become a good friend, an athletic trainer and a chiropractor, Pete Thomas here in the Pittsburgh area, who was referred to me and I met him through the podcasting. I started seeing him. And one of the things he said the first day, which really was like a head slap. He said, look, Ben, you haven't been as active as you used to be doing for four years. You're trying to behave like it's 2012 and it's 2013. Slow down, do less. And six months from now, you'll be doing more. And I felt like the biggest idiot because this is advice I would give to you if I was training you as a personal client. Right. Or as a personal training client. And for me, I couldn't see that because there I was like, well, I'm different. I'm special. It's like, no, I'm not biggest special. critic. <laughs> and so now at various times when I've tweaked my back or done something, I know that I can go see Pete and he's going to say, oh yeah, this is what you've done. You know, yes, it's going to take some time, but don't jump off the cliff. Right. It's so important to have that support system because we can be our biggest critic and be risk more, you know, the hardest on ourselves over anybody else. So it's important to have people, you know, fact check those thoughts for us. <laughs> I'm going to steal that fact check. I like that. Yeah. I was just talking to, to it was a part of the self-care and she was talking about, you know, we, we might think something, but you would need to think of these, you know, really be aware of your thoughts and look at them and be like, is this true or is it not true? But is it, it could be 50% true, but is it a hundred percent true? <laughs> so always, always fact check those thoughts. Now, many of us have desk jobs where we have to work in front of a computer for eight hours a day or more. And these days that can be unavoidable and we can't all go quit our jobs. So what are some movement lifestyle hacks and tips to kind of offset the negative health effects of sitting or lack of movement throughout the day? I would say the number one is set a timer on your computer. So you're not sitting in one spot for more than 20 or 30 minutes. And because I know when I do a lot of writing and, you know, my major job is a university professor, I teach online. When I do a lot of writing, I'm standing, but if I was sitting within 20 minutes, I'd be down there like this hunched over thinking. So don't hold a position for more than 15, 20 minutes. And that doesn't mean you have to go and you have to do something for 20 minutes, step out of the desk, you know, do touch your toes two or three times, do two or three pushups, get back on. Some people are going to say, well, but my office workers are going to look at me strangely. So maybe for some people, one of the benefits of COVID is if they're working from home now, the office worker is their cat and the cat's going to look at them and say, eh, well, that's that crazy Christy. I'm just going to go back to sleep. But the other thing is, so what? A few years ago, a few years ago, one of the things that I started to do again, this was after herniating my disc is I decided I'm going to start having more fun. So I wanted a little balance board or balance beam. So I looked at some plans online and you can go to your favorite big box store and buy PVC pipe. So I took my girlfriend and I said, I got to figure out, you know, how long a piece of PVC pipe I want and how, how large a diameter I want. So I'm pulling out pieces of eight foot, 10 foot, 12 foot PVC pipe. And my girlfriend's going, don't do that. People are going to look at you. And I'm walking across this PVC pipe. And the amazing thing is people are pushing their carts by. They're not even looking at me. 
my self absorbed. <laughs> and if you get the reputation as the crazy person who's jumping up every 15 minutes, that's not a bad reputation to have. I would say, in addition to that, if you're stuck at a desk, see what you can do to adapt to maybe some of the time you're on a standing desk. In no way I'm going to say, am I going to say, oh, standing is, is the best thing to do? Because it's just as easy to lock yourself in one position when you're standing. One of the reasons I have the wobble board. I got a standing desk about six or seven years ago. It's an adjustable one that sets on top of another desk. So hmm. I can put it up and down. I haven't put it down yet, but I have gotten the wobble board. So you can see me if I'm typing or I'm talking on the phone, I can move around quite a bit, still stay in the camera. So it keeps me mobile. And as you and I were chatting before we started recording, when I find that my knees are getting sore, my ankles are getting sore, it's like, oh, it's time to take a 10 minute break, walk around, maybe sit down for that 10 minutes. So be as mobile as possible, figure out what, so that would be my biggest cue or my biggest hack. Yeah. If you're, work, when if, I was, you're work, if you're working in an office building, you don't have to take the elevator. You can take the steps. That's going to keep you moving. Uh, figure out when you can move. It's very easy to get stuck in the rut. And I, and I know you mentioned this before we started recording. There are some people six o'clock in the morning, six 30 in the morning, they're starting their commute to be at the office at eight o'clock. And they may be there till six o'clock afterwards. They get home and they may not have the energy to do something. Well, if you've been sitting at a desk all day and then you have a training at lunchtime or at lunchtime, a bunch of your coworkers say, hey, let's go out and get some lunch. It's very easy to spend 8, 10, 12 hours never taking that, that many steps. And I'm not saying steps are the answer. Some people have walking treadmills on their desks, depending on the office that they're working at. Some people have co-working spaces where you can pick and choose. Are you sitting on a sofa? Are you at a mobile desk? Don't think that this is the way that I have to work. Think about what can I do to adapt it or make it better for me. When I first got out of grad school and I took a job at a college in Florida, I was fortunate enough is I was a new faculty member. So they said, what do you want for a chair? I said, well, I want a Swiss ball. Hmm. One of those big inflatable balls. Because I knew I had tried through grad school the fancy desk chairs, the knee chairs that I don't know if you remember those where you rest on your knees. Yes. And I found the bad thing about the knee chairs. If I was doing a lot of typing, what I would do is I would put my feet where the knees would go, put my elbows on my knees and type. So I'd be hunched over like a little uh, <laughs> hunchback of, of Notre Dame for, from that movie or that book. So I knew that wouldn't work. I knew that with the ball, I had to stay active. I had to keep my feet planted. I had to do a little bit of moving around and when I had a difficult time staying on the ball, it was time to get up and move around. And one of the coolest things is like eight or nine years later, I get a, a Facebook message from one of my former students with a picture and said, I always wished I had a chair like yours. And I finally got, got my employer to buy me a Swiss ball. So now I have a Swiss ball in my office, just like you had. Beautiful. So as I said, if you even get one person and you really believe in what you're talking about, then that's a success. Absolutely. And it, and it was interesting because when I was uh, researching and for the show, I was reading all about sitting and, you know, and listening to your methods. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try this. So I have a, it's, I don't have an adjustable desk, but I have a island in my kitchen and I have one of those adjustable um, racks to put my computer on that goes up probably about a foot and then down flat. So I put that and I was like, all right, I'm going to try the standing. What a difference. I mean, it made a big difference for me. I, I felt like I could think better. I felt like I had more energy. And then, like you said, you know, shifting one foot to the other. And then when I felt like I was kind of getting a little stuck in my standing position and felt a little maybe tired, I was like, all right, I'll, I'll sit in a chair for a bit or walk around. Very big difference and a very small minor thing. And we also expend more energy while we're standing as opposed to sitting. Exactly. And I, and I even find myself, if I end up these days on a phone call as opposed to a Zoom call, hmm. I find myself walking throughout the house. Right. It's very, I work from home. It's very hard to sit down and have a conversation. So again, as I mentioned, if you see me, I'm stepping off the wobble board back on. I just, some nope. people would say I fidget, but it just seems that I think better that way. And, you know, so much you think about if you go back to when you were in, in grade school and high school, 
and even college, if you went to college, if you were one of those fidgeters, you were probably reprimanded. It's like, hey, you yeah. need to stay, you need to stay still. And it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, occasionally I do have to go on campus. And we have department meetings, and I sit in the back. And I mean, when I first started, I mentioned to the department chair, it's like, you know, if you see me standing up in the back, it's just because the chairs are very, very uncomfortable. And he goes, no problem. So people really aren't gonna you just make care, it work. or you you can you can push it. And it's not saying you have to say, oh, everybody has to have a standing desk, but just be aware of what you do. Right, and I think that's a great point because. Um... We had uh, somebody on that's an expert in traditional Chinese medicine, and we're talking about the importance of the fascia. And that's basically the kind of reasoning behind it. It's it's not sitting as bad or you know standing as better necessarily. I mean, you do expend more energy standing, but your fascia system gets you know it's it's don't hold the same position for too long. <laughs> it's yeah, I think, I think and there's, there, there's a, there's a, a well-known uh, physical therapist, Dr. Shirley Sarman, who's written some great textbooks. I mean, her comment is, and this is based on, on research, you know, tissue is plastic and you shouldn't hold the position for more than 20 minutes. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people will say with Chinese medicine, oh, that's a bunch of, of uh, bullpucky, but it's been around thousands of years and there's something years. there. And as a anecdotal end of one, when I herniated my disc, one of the things that really helped relieve the spasms was acupuncture. So yeah. it's kind of like one of the things that I look at with this whole journey with movement is, first of all, can I figure out why it works? Is there research out there? Sometimes yeah. there is, sometimes there isn't. And then the second thing is, is this doing anything that can potentially harm me or hurt me long term? Right. Let's so see. if it, if if it's something that's potentially dangerous, then I have to assess: is it worth is it worth doing it? In most cases, unless we're elite athletes, it probably isn't. You know, if you're an elite athlete, there's this is probably going way back to when I took my basic psych class. You know, they they once did a survey of Olympic athletes and said if you could win a gold medal and you'd be dead within ten years, and I may be off on the on the years, would you do it? And an overwhelmingly high percentage said yes. Wow. You know, on the other hand, you know, if somebody said to me, hey, Ben, you could run a two hour and 20 minute marathon, but you die 10 years earlier, would you do it? Right now, I'd say no. And I like to think, but I don't know, back when I was 21 or 22, my dad always said I had a strong self-preservation instinct. I like to think I'd say no then too. Right. Is it, do you want the glory or do you want the longevity? <laughs> so what, what's the right amount of movement to offset this negative health damage? There's, I mean, I'm sure it's different for everyone, but is there like a certain kind of minimum amount of movement per day we should all be doing? You had to ask that question, didn't you? <laughs> I mean, there's gotta be, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's, I don't know how much research has been done, but is there any, any sort of data on that? Not a whole lot. I mean, you do see the basic recommendations that, that I mentioned from the World Health Organization and other professional organizations, but it doesn't take into account what people do the rest of the time. I think what people need to do is they need to be very, very conscious and they need to figure out a couple of things. They need to figure out, first of all, if I exercise and I feel better, I'm more productive, as you mentioned, how much exercise or rather than exercise, how much movement does it take? Second thing they need to think about is what is something that I'm going to do? So for example, if you dislike going to the gym and lifting weights, I'm a huge proponent of lifting weights, especially as you get older and you start to lose muscle mass. I think it's very important. But if you're somebody who absolutely hates going to the gym, you don't like the atmosphere, you feel that you're judged there, maybe you can't afford it, then figure out what you can do that you enjoy instead of that. I've got a good friend of mine who when he retired to Colorado, he and his wife bought a house on four acres. He hates going to the gym. Hmm. So a lot of what his work is, he does landscaping. He's actually moved big rocks and things like that to, to make the landscape that they want. If you're somebody who does a lot of gardening, if you're one of the big things that's popular in some parts of the country is rucking or carrying a backpack, a weighted backpack and, and walking. Hmm. You know, so when you say how much it should there be, I would say I would like to see most people accumulate an hour or more 
most days of the week. And this that is would be movement. Movement. So there's already there's already recommendations out there. The the uh, two to three days a week of resistance training, the three to five days of aerobic training, depending on how much. I think those are excellent. I think everybody should do that. I try to do that. That's important to me. Irregardless of that, because if you think if you do that, that's basically five to six hours a week of movement or of exercise. Most of us probably spend more time than that playing uh, some sort of games, Wordle or something like that on our, our phones or surfing through Instagram. So my goal for most people or my goal, my recommendation for most people is try to accumulate that. That doesn't mean you have to go out and walk for an hour. That doesn't mean you have to hop on the Peloton bike or go to the gym if you do that for now. Accumulate it throughout the day. So maybe if you take the bus or public transportation to work, you allow enough time for 10 minutes of walking around the block. You know, you can probably find another 10 minutes at another time. So you build it up in increments. Would it be better if you did it continuously? Maybe, but the most important thing is if you get three months down the line, have I moved more? And then also assess, do I feel better? Right. One of the things, again, kind of like my Cairo athletic trainer, Pete said to me, it's like, you're trying to train like it was four years ago is with my Labrador, because one of the drugs that she got, uh, caused neural slowing of neural senses because you didn't want seizures. It caused her to drag her rear paws. And the neurologist said, Oh, she's starting to, to tear her paws. You need to switch to soft surfaces. So we switched from a mixture of hard surfaces to all soft surfaces within a week. I felt much better. Hmm. And again, I'm an idiot because I have always said that if I'm going to run, if I'm going to train for a marathon, I'm going to run on soft surfaces because I feel better. Well, I got away from that because I was focusing on all the trees immediately. It's like, oh, wow, those little niggling aches and pains that I had, those things that weren't really comfortable, they went away. So how much did you move? Probably more than you're moving. Um, recognize that Everybody is going to have stress in their life. There's you stress or good stress and distress and bad stress. And when somebody says, well, I need, to, I need to do some sort of stress relief, it's not stress relief, it's stress management. One of the things for me, movement is stress management. And probably the gentleman that I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast who told my major professor in grad school, send Ben for a run when he's a jerk, probably recognized that, hey, this is a good stress reliever for Ben. He's more easy going when he gets some movement in. So I would say, figure out, and this may involve keeping a journal. You may know this int intuitively. And I know for me, 40 minutes of some sort of activity. One of the great things about podcasting is you've probably learned is you learn so much from other people and you like name drop and you on the one hand you feel like you're name dropping on the other hand it's like man this person gave me some great info other people should know that this is the person out there so about two years ago i interviewed a sleep researcher an irishman who's living in australia dr ian dinnikin he has another podcast so i recommend that to your listeners and he made a comment he said for me it's almost a non-negotiable that i do an hour of movement a day he goes i've learned it's not for my physical well-being. It's for my mental well-being. I think better. I'm a better husband. I'm more productive. So everybody's going to have that sweet spot of movement, irregardless of the recommendations of exercise. For right. me, it seems to be about 40 minutes. However, I will tell you, an ideal movement day for me is going to be an hour to an hour and a half soft surface in the woods, hopefully with my dogs running, walking, fart licking come home, have, have a meal, and then go out for a two to three hour mountain bike or gravel bike ride. Again, off-road, soft surfaces in nature, if you've ever heard of nature bathing, trail bathing, et cetera. Okay. That would be a dream day for me. Now, if I can get that in once or twice a week or once every two weeks, I'm a super happy camper. But I'm the same person that when I'm going to a conference, like I have to go to uh, New Orleans in July for, for one of my conferences. It's going to be six o'clock in the morning before everything starts. And I'm going to be out there for a 40 to 45 minute walk jog because I know that's when I'll do it. I know I'm more productive doing my activity in the morning. And it's too easy if I get into something like that, where, you know, we get to five o'clock. One of my friends says, Hey Ben, let's go get a drink. Let's go out to dinner. And I'm not going to get that movement in. And I may not, not notice it on day one or day two, but by day three, I'm probably going to be a grouch. And all my aches and pains that I've acquired from doing too much training or not moving in the right way when I was young and dumb are going to catch up to me. 
So you've probably heard the phrase motion is lotion. It is. It doesn't have to be intense. And, you know, everybody thinks, well, you have to work up a sweat. You have to feel like you've gotten something. That's a workout. Right. Movement doesn't have to be stressful. I mean, we used there to call a difference it. between working out and movement. And we're right. talking Every, about movement. We're talking, right. we're talking about movement specifically. Yeah. Again, I'm not saying forget all the World Health Organization, American College of Sports Medicine recommendations. I want you to do that. I want you to do the resistance training. This is a separate thing. What can I do to adapt or change my life? Uh, some people might say, well, I don't want to give up watching football. Well, there's no reason you can't watch football while walking on a treadmill. There's no reason you can't watch football while, you know, doing some sort of movement with your kids. It's a, it's a conscious choice. And there are some people where movement is natural. And I think, you know, I was very benefited growing up. My dad was not an athlete. My mom was not an athlete, but I did grow up on a dairy farm. And my dad was always willing to throw a baseball with me or something like that. And, you know, he's 80 something and he still rides a bike. So I had a really good role model for people who don't have role models. You know, maybe their parents are working, you know, 80, 90, hundred hours a week, or they're commuting long periods of time. Podcasts like this and people saying, Hey, it's okay to move. You can be abnormal compared to many things or many people. I had a great interview with, with a uh, physician who does marketing, Dr. E as a podcast. And he spent some time in Spain with his wife. And he said, one of the things that Americans were shocked about when he said, you know, two or three days a week, they, they eat gelato. They're like, well, why are you doing that? You can't have dessert. That's bad for you. He said, what they didn't realize is he and his wife and his young son would walk two or three kilometers to the gelato shop. Mm -hmm. They would have a small serving of gelato, probably about half the size of what a child serving is here in the U S and then they would walk two or three kilometers home. Right. It's all about balance. You know, it's not about hopping into your car, driving to the nearest yogurt shop and having, well, the medium is $5 and the large is only a dollar more. So of course I want a dollar more, you know, try the next time you go to the restaurant and you order the hamburger because you really have that urge for the hamburger and you say, I don't want the fries. And they look at you and they say, but the fries are included. It's like, but I don't want the fries. I want the hamburger. Right. Right. And I think that's, that's the difference is, you know, finding ways to find movement, you know, is walk, walking to the store, walking to the ice cream store. If, if you want to get ice cream, is there, um, um, specific, cause we're talking about movement as opposed to exercise. So can you give some examples? So movement is not scrolling on your phone. It's not some movement. It's not exercise as far as doing weights or, you know, that's separate. What would be some specifics so we can really be clear on what this movement aspect is? It's actually funny. You said scrolling on the phone. I've, I've actually seen a couple of research studies that have measured the caloric uh, output of scrolling or what they, what they term fidgeting. Right. That, that's a great question. I would say movement would be moving without a specific goal. Right. So on the one hand, think of it as meaningless, meaningful movement. You're consciously making a choice to move. But if you're going for a walk, it's not like, okay, we're doing five miles. Right. Whether you like it or not, whether we have to walk up this hill through this road construction, we're doing five miles. It's like, oh, let's take a walk. Right. Take the stairs, stand. Take, take stand the, you, know, you know, the last time you flew, did you hop on the human escalator or... Did you walk between the escalators? Mm. And I suspect what you find is if you hopped on the human escalator, then you got to your baggage and you stood there. Yep. One of the things when I lived in Atlanta that I thought was great is you could walk, uh, you could walk from where the planes landed and I'm losing my train of thought on what, what it is, but you could walk all the way land, landslide. You could walk all the way landslide and it was about a 25 minute walk. So you could take the train and you could take the escalators and then you could stand around the luggage. And most of the times that I flew, I was getting in late at night. Or you could walk 20 or 25 minutes and pretty much just about every time I was flying Delta that you ended up at the luggage, your luggage was coming out. Mm. So it was a way on a travel day where you may be spending a lot of time sitting that you could get a little bit of movement. In. Um, stairs instead of the elevator. If you're going to shop We've all seen that guy or lady with the fancy car who parks all the way in the back of the parking lot with the car uh, taking up three or four spots. You can park in the back and uh, 
and, and walk forward. How many times have you seen somebody pull into your favorite grocery store and they drive around and they, they pull into that closest spot so they can walk? Right. Um, figure out things that you can do. I mean, the big thing for movement is finding things that you enjoy. One of the things, and I say this in all seriousness, seriousness, not jokingly, the thing that really depresses me the most about social media and about talking to friends is when they go on vacation, you see somebody saying, oh, I'm so happy to fill in your favorite vacation spot. I don't have to work out this week. Hmm. You know, I'm one of those people it's like, if I'm going someplace, you know, one of the great ways to explore a city is to walk. Yes. One of, one of the, I mean, if you want to get a hellacious workout and you have to, uh, I don't know how you feel about Las Vegas. I hate Las Vegas, but I have to go there for conferences. <laughs> uh, some people love it. You know, if you walk the length of a strip early in the morning or late at night, right? that's a lot of movement. You know, or even walking that, around the hotels and casinos. Or even walk, I mean, I, I, fa- I found walks. this was, we were there a couple of years ago for a conference and we were at the far end of the strip at a steakhouse. 10 o'clock at night, we get out and three or four people are like, well, we're going to get a taxi and three or four of us, well, we're just going to walk back. So, you know, it's two, two and a half miles. You didn't have to be anywhere. If we, if we taken the taxi back, would we have gotten back 30 minutes, 40 minutes sooner? Yes. But what would we have done? Probably sat around or stood around talking this way. We got to people walk and, or people watch and walk. Fresh air and being outdoors. Exactly. So it's all these conscious kind of this mindset shift and making it's, constant decisions to find more ways to incorporate it, it's a, it's a complete it's a complete and and not being afraid to try new things you know i mean one of the things my grandmother who has since passed away at 102 or 103 wow. when she was 80 something she decided she wanted to try whitewater rafting amazing well, my father took her whitewater <laughs> rafting i mean some people would say oh my god how could you do that now it was class three rapids on the east coast so it wasn't super super severe it's still pretty intense still pretty I've done you know, so many people are saying i can't do that you know one of the one of the things that's growing for people across the country that you've probably heard about is playing pickleball yes to me that just sounds and from what i've seen there's a pickleball court near where i park my car with my dogs it just looks incredibly horrible to me, but that's me personally. Right. If you enjoy pickleball and you know, you don't move a whole lot, but you'll go and you'll move with your friends or your son or your daughter or your wife or husband, then I'm a huge fan of pickleball yoga classes to me, you know, for some people, they're a workout for some people, they do them in their home. They have a yoga routine that they go through every morning. It centers them to me. That's horrible. I won't do it. I hate it. Right. But if that works for you, that's great. If you're moving, that's great. Gardening, if you have if you have a garden, one of the things we did when COVID first hit and they closed everything down is I, I'm fortunate enough to live on a little bit over four acres. And I've lived here for 11 or 12 years. And when I first moved in, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to make walking trails and mountain bike trails. Mm-hmm. Well, COVID hit. It's like, oh, well, let's let's make some trails. So, you know, you go out and you move for two or three hours doing this and you find you take 15 or 20,000 steps It's not a workout per se, although I'll tell you some mornings when you're dragging trees around, you feel it, but it's movement. So it it is a conscious choice. Somebody says the great thing about it being a mindset. I mean, some, I mentioned some of the best people that I have met, I've met through movement. When I was in grad school at Auburn, I was fortunate enough to meet a bunch of people, a gentleman, a good friend of mine who I mentioned, who's retired to Colorado. Um, a friend of mine whose career Navy, who was getting his degree at Auburn. And five or six years ago, I was speaking at a conference in DC and he was stationed at the Pentagon. I hadn't seen him in 20, 20 years, 15 years, but we kept in touch through social media. And it's like, Hey, I'm going to be in town. You know, you want to meet up? He's like, sure. You know, come stay with me and my wife, my kids afterwards. It's like, by the way, I run at four 30 or five 30 every morning. You want to meet me for a run? And we met at five 30 on a Friday morning. We hadn't run in probably 15 years together. Same conversations, same sort of things. Gentleman in Colorado three or four years ago, hey, come visit me. I was out there for a conference. I went and visited him and his wife. Over the course of four days, we exercised 20 plus hours. And I'm not saying everybody has to do that. I'm probably a little excessive, but this is what we did. You know, we hiked, we biked, we, we walked, and we fell into those same conversations. I've had the good fortune to interview uh, physicians if you ever notice some of your best conversations probably come when you're walking. If you sit down with a friend, maybe if you sit down with a friend and you consume a lot of alcohol and the inhibitions get lower, maybe Mm -hmm. you'll have some of those good good conversations. 
you probably won't remember them the next day and you won't feel well. But some of those conversations, because you're walking, especially if you're outside, the inhibitions are down, you can talk, you can have these conversations. And it's really has a tendency to be less intense because if you and I are having a conversation, we're covering serious topics or personal topics. If I'm like staring at you, if you tell me a secret, I'm like, oh my God. So it's, it's a way to not, not uh, let stress control you, to manage stress, to, to figure out ways to enhance the quality of life. And if you think about what you're doing and being conscious about how you move, most of us can add more meaningful, meaningless movement into our life. Right. And there's, and as you were talking about, there's this concept that uh, movement and exercise actually creates more energy, which is great for those who feel like they don't have enough energy to exercise. Um, how, how exactly does that work? Uh, I know it's probably very complex, but briefly, and what are kind of some benefits of incorporating movement? You talked about it, it actually decreases our stress, helps with brain function. Uh, uh, increase, well, increases blood flow throughout the body. Right. Uh, will, will release endorphins. You've probably heard of the runner's high. Not everybody gets the runner's high, but it will increase your sympathetic nervous system to make you think a little more clearly. Um, if you're focusing on a problem, if you've ever had a problem and you just can't get that solution and you take a break, or I mentioned all of my good ideas have come when I'm walking or running or biking, you know, it's, I think it's because we have a tendency to just focus, focus, focus. And if we can disassociate our brain with the movement, maybe we get that we get those ideas. There's something about, and this is, I mentioned forest bathing, you know, there's something if you have the opportunity to get to a park or you have an opportunity to get to where there are trees and grass, uh, the, the sounds, the smells, you know, the, the Japanese have forest bathing where you just sit there and soak in the environment. So that's very closely related to movement. As far as giving you more energy, if you just sit there, your body has a tendency to slow its metabolism. Now, slow walking is not going to burn that many calories, but movement is going to increase blood flow. So it's going to increase oxygen to the tissues. It's going to increase uh, venous return. If you notice, if you've ever taken a long flight, you may get off the plane and notice that you've got swollen ankles. That's why mm -hmm. they're always concerned. People who have uh, circulatory problems, they may recommend that they wear circulatory hose or, or compression socks. And the recommendation, you know, often is, you know, if you're on a, a transatlantic flight to get up every hour or so, or do ankle pumps or things like that. So the movement can help keep you physiologically active. And I would chal challenge anybody who doesn't do movement when they start to say I mean, movement. One of the other things it can do is it can help relieve pain. Hmm. So N of one, actually N of two, cause I've got a good friend. I've got, I've herniated a couple of discs. I know that if I'm not active specifically walking up hills, so this is the N of one, just me or riding my bicycle within a week or so, my back is going to ache more. Right. So there's no research on this. My hypothesis is, is because when I'm walking, I'm walking up hills, those muscles in my low back are contracting isometrically and they're working and they're allowing me to put less stress on the discs, less stress on the ligaments. So this is one of those things where you say, if, if, if I told all of my clients, oh, you need to walk at least 40 minutes a day, you need to walk uphill because your back won't hurt if you have back pain. I can't say that. I can say it's an N of one, it's me. I can say, I think this is why it's happening. And I can also say, me doing this is not hurting anything. So I'm going to keep doing it. Yes. Um, now, for those who would like to connect with you, where can we find you? And do you have any other great resources around movement and making movement a lifestyle that we can all check out? Sure. So the easiest way to connect with me, because there's so much social media, some good, some bad, is if you search FitLab PGH, F-I-T-L-A-B PGH on Google, about the first three pages will be, a, will be us. If you're looking for where's the best place to get it to find everything, I'm gonna say Instagram. And the reason I'm gonna say Instagram is because in addition to posting our podcasts three times a week, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we post a one minute movement tip lifestyle hack video, mm. just little simple things. Um, 
if you don't really like uh, listening to somebody tell you, give you movement tips, most of them take place outdoors with Labradors cavorting around. Mm -hmm. And then because everybody learns a different differently and because we have a tendency to take this topic too seriously, every Thursday we have a written lab lessons as in Labradors. So advice from the Labradors. The advice uh, yesterday was don't overschedule your life. And there's usually the acute collage of the, of the two Labradors and just a little simple advice. So we have a tendency to overcomplicate these things. And what we're trying to do with movement as a lifestyle saying, hey, you can complicate it, but start easy, start simple. And here's a way to get some tips and ideas. And if you like it, follow it, tell your friends about it. If you got questions, send us a DM. Love it. Everybody loves dogs. So that helps bring, bring the dogs in. <laughs> and do you still do one-on-one -on -one training? I do a little bit of one-on-one -on -one training because as somebody who teaches at a university, I think if, you, if you're going to teach, you should also be a practitioner. So yes, I do do some one-on-one -on -one training. Absolutely. And, and do you do it um, in person or do you do it via Zoom? Predominantly, I've done it in person. Um, I'm fortunate enough, my girlfriend's dad has a townhouse here and she has, he has built out the basement that I designed it into a, a fitness facility for one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two. Wonderful. So I will post links below to all your contact information. Before we wrap it up, do you have any final thoughts or words for those that are maybe lacking movement in their lives and want to make a change and figure out how to start? I, I, would, I would say two things. First of all, if you aren't moving, get checked out by a doctor just to make sure everything is hunky-dory. You know, it's, it's never wrong to get clearance from a medical professional. And then number two, start slow, make it reasonable. You know, it's very easy to say, I'm going to exercise every day. And then when you miss a day, you just beat yourself up. Tell yourself, I'm going to try to get some sort of movement in 10 or 15 minutes, at least three days this week. And if you do that, continue to do that. And if you say, okay, what can I do that's more? And find things that enjoy you, that you enjoy. If you've got grandkids, take your grandkid to the park. Swing on the swing, go down the slide, have some fun. Maybe, maybe not the monkey bars the first day. <laughs> um, you know, if you enjoy working in your garden or, you, or it's, we're getting to the time of year, you you wish you could do a garden, get some containers and do con container gardening where maybe you don't have to dig up the earth. So start slow, get cleared by a physician and find things that you enjoy. And then finally know if you are a person who needs an accountability partner or you're somebody who likes to do solo exercise. Like I know some people love going to yoga classes. They love going to uh, uh, meetups that are walks and hikes. They love going to group exercise classes. For me, that's my idea of the seventh level of hell, like to go into a loud spin class, but that's me personally. So if you're the person who likes to do those things, then try to schedule some of those things. If you're the person who prefers more solo activities or with one or two close friends, Maybe find an accountability partner or a friend who's got a same goal. I've got a good friend of mine from college. She and one of her girlfriends meet at 5.30 every morning to walk because kids aren't going to be up there, up then. Husband's just getting up, and this is the time that they can have the time for themselves. Now, are they doing it because of the exercise, or are they doing it because it's their opportunity to work on managing their stress or having some use stress? I don't know, and I'll it doesn't matter. Up. Yeah, they're, they're, they're moving, they're enjoying it. And she's done it for probably the last eight or nine years. So it's working for her. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Ben, and sharing your wisdom on movement. Now we have some really great lifestyle hacks to incorporate movement into our lives. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Remember, knowledge is power. The more you understand about your body, the better you're able to stay healthy and prevent disease. And a reminder, I'm not your doctor, so please don't take this as medical advice. If you have specific questions about your healthcare, feel free to reach out to your practitioner. And if you like this video, please like it and share with others. This information could really help someone you may know and hit that subscribe button and the little bell to be sure you don't miss out on our future shows and join us next Wednesday for the next episode of Discovering True Health.